almost 30 of us at Co-op Power, and um, we were talking about when we're in it for me and when we're in it for we. And uh, I think part of the uh, part of the reason that our train is kind of heading off the cliff right now is that we've been we live in a culture that's really in it for me, and we've been taught that. And I was talking to my daughter last night. She finished her MBA program at the University of Chicago, and it was pretty much that is what she was taught. That was what she was taught. That's what we're producing in our, um, you know, masters in business administration graduates. Is you go out and you get as much as you can, and it's short term. It's not looking at the future. It's not looking at how what the impact is on our communities, on wealth, um, in wealth distribution in our world, on climate change. It's not looking in at all those things. So um, I think that's one of the, the themes I'm bringing today. Is how can we look at what's in it for me? How can we move the conversation? There are many louder. We'll, we'll see if the microphones help. You have to tell me. The acoustics in here are terrible. Really? Uh, is this, does this help? Not no. yet. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It is on. It's on. It is on. I could try to speak louder, but it's really not loud. Thing. Um, <laughs> it's true. Maybe I'll um, tell me if it works better if I'm here. Are the acoustics yeah. better? Yeah. I don't think the mic is working. Mic, mic is not working? Yeah. No. Okay, so I won't bother. Yeah. It's a prop. <laughs> it's a prop, yes. I can pretend I'm uh, singing a great song. Um, so, so the first thing, the theme is that we're in it for we. What is our community interest? How can we raise this boat so that we're all making some progress together? And the second theme I want to raise up is that we are all investors shaping the world that we live in. And every thought, word, and deed that comes from us shapes our future. It's not just the people with a lot of money that are determining what our future is. It's all of us. And it's, it's not just people with a lot of money, it's people who have one dollar that you spend on one day. Where you spend that counts. Uh, everything we do counts. And um, we, we kind of have a way to pretend that's not true. Um, that we can just go and buy this from Walmart, and we can just go um, invest in Wall Street into tobacco companies and you know, we have to make our return and this is the way we're going to make it. So it, it, it's like it, we, ha we live in a culture that says it's okay that we don't pay attention to everything. It's too much. How could we ever do it? You know, but the truth is we, we can't do it by ourselves. But together we can figure it out. And it's not about being bad. Or I talked to one of our Co-op Power members for about a half hour yesterday. And he said, you know, I was thinking about coming to your event, but it's just not realistic. And I said, well, tell me more. Like, what are you thinking about? He said, well, I'm stewarding $250,000, and this is my future. This is the money I'm counting on to take me and my wife into old age. I need a 10% return every year. <laughs> and I don't settle for anything less. So, and I said to him, I said, well, how are you, how, how, hmm. I said, how does that match your values? He said, well, it doesn't. It doesn't match my values. So, and I said, well, uh, well what do you think about that? How are, you, how are you, you know, making sense of that? He said, well, I've decided what's in it for me is the most important. And I think we all come to that. There are times when we're ill, when we're, you know, we have to take care of ourselves, there's something going on, we've got to kind of go back in. But um, I think that's part of the discussion, is when do we require that how we think the energy we're putting out in the world, whether we're hopeful or in despair, how we spend our money, how we invest our time, what we volunteer for, you know, all of those things. It just matters a whole lot. So thank you for investing your time in today. Um, let's see. I, I want to tell you just a little bit. Um, when I was growing up, my dad was a Lutheran minister. 
he still is actually vibrant, very charismatic, wonderful, 80 years old, still preaching every Sunday. And um, he, when I was uh, little, he started a church in a brand new community out in the Midwest. And the congregants all put their money in and built the building. And I just remember being at the groundbreaking of this community that uh, you know, came together and was so proud having this building they invested in. So this, kind of, this work is kind of in my DNA a little bit. I was also raised by that community. I was you know, one of the minister's kids, so everybody kind of came together. Anything I wanted or was thinking about, people were excited about. And so I grew up in a community that really started um, looking at, it. we started from the we perspective. It was easy to think of. And a lot of people don't have that same opportunity. So thinking about me is more natural. So how is it that we transition? I'm curious about that, but part of the conversation. Um, let's see what else I want to say. A couple more things. Um, race and class. So that's one of the threads, I think, for us also today, is that as most of the people in the United States have had their income decrease by half, the most wealthy people in our world, in our country, since 83, have had their income double. And so the wealth concentration in this country is just really phenomenal. And, and I was sitting with a group of uh, young people in Holyoke who were getting trained to work at Energia where um, Mark, where did he go? Thank you, where Mark works. And um, we were just talking about how, how people uh, get money. You know, what, who are, who's successful? And they said, well, anybody that follows their dreams can be a millionaire. <laughs> so these are 19-year-old Latino folks who they grew up on the streets in Holyoke. Anybody who follows their dream can be a millionaire. I'm like, really? Tell, tell me about that. How, how does that work? And um, they, I said, can you tell me any example of people you know who work really hard and follow their dreams who are millionaires? They said, well, no, no not really. <laughs> but, you know, this guy who sells weapons has a whole lot of money. I said, does he work real hard? Well, not really. Uh, I said, well, you know, do you know any people that work really hard and follow their dreams that are not millionaires? So, well, you know, my uncle, uh, he works great. My, my mom, she works really, really hard. So if we have these belief systems that say that people who have money deserve that money mm -hmm. and can invest it in any way that doesn't match their ethical base, their ethical values even, um, and that all that's okay. So I just want to put this out on the, you know, as part of our conversation today, that, that um, wealth isn't, it, it, people who have wealth are stewarding that wealth. They didn't maybe all get it because they deserved it. They're stewarding it because it comes from long family lines. I've talked to so many people in our network who have wealth that they're not that comfortable with. Actually, one of my best friends, Chuck Collins, is an heir for the Oscar Mayer fortune. And he wrote a book with some friends of his called We Gave Away a Fortune. And that's what they did. They gave it away. They were looking and said, well, you know, this really isn't ours. And they gave it away to a group of people who represented a lot of class and race diversity to reinvest in the world in a way that would make more sense. When I was um, uh, working on trying to raise the money for Northeast Biodiesel, I met a, a gentleman from, uh, who was working in connection with the Rudolf Steiner Foundation, and we actually got a loan from this uh, fund that he works with, and we were uh, talking about the interest rate. And I said, well, we're willing to pay 9%. And he said, hmm, the Rudolf Steiner Foundation, our um, investors have met, and we feel like 4% is really what makes sense in the world that more than 4% return isn't appropriate. So we'll charge you 4% for your $130,000 loan. 
And I said, whoa, oh, okay. Uh, that's fine, that's great. Uh, this is a real hard negotiation. And then we're getting down to the part where, um, you know, what's, what's gonna happen if we default, thank you, uh, if we default on a, our payment. And I said, well, you know, you can put on a penalty. So, um, you know, we'll like add another 5% interest to our payments if we get in arrears. He said, well, if you're in arrears, that means you're having trouble making the payment. So maybe we'll lower it to 3% interest. <laughs> I practically started crying because I worked so hard to try to you know, raise money and I'd been to so many banks and felt like I, a little bit of my soul was lost each time in those negotiations. I just felt like I was lifted up because that conversation was about how to use money. So I was emotional. Is how to use money in a way that heals the world, that makes such a difference in the world. So it's with that spirit of generosity, that spirit of we, I want to invite us to this conversation today. Thank you all so much for coming. And our next speaker. <laughs> they say timing is everything, and right now my timing is horrible. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is John Cronin, um, and in a room full of optimism, I am pessimism, <laughs> capital P. Um, I am the uh, securities director for the state of Vermont, um, and that means my job is to regulate the offer and sale of securities. Securities is one of the most broadly defined words under federal and state law, as many of you are going to be familiar with. So just about everything you have touched on so far this morning, I have jurisdiction over. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> so if I move, it's because I'm anticipating missiles coming from the crowd. <laughs> um, so I, I am very excited to be here this morning. And, and, I, and I want to relay a couple of things. I've had some great conversations with Mark and with Christian, with Glenn, and, and, and um, for 14 years I have either been in the financial services industry or a regulator thereof. Um, it is the last 12 months that I've really had to focus on small company, small organization, capital formation. And what we've seen is, we've seen this, this groundswell that starts to come. Is anybody from Burlington? Or the Burlington area, been to Burlington recently. Okay, the, just off Church Street, if anybody's been to Church Street, just off Church Street for years, there was a McDonald's. Okay, the pinnacle of corporate America. <laughs> Guess what's gone? McDonald's. It was gutted. It was replaced with a, a restaurant called The Farmhouse. Now The Farmhouse is a local for establishment. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. you go there and they, they focus on local farms. They focus on local beverages. This place is awesome, wow. okay? It is a great, great story. It is one of the few things that after 20 some odd years of living in, in that portion of Vermont that still draws me to downtown um, Burlington. So it's this really exciting time. And, and, and Lynn spoke, asked me specifically to, to give you folks an overview of the Jobs Act. And, and, if, if, if I'm somewhat disciplined and, and the timekeepers are somewhat um, able to control me, I'll get there. Um, <laughs> but all of a sudden, you know, you've had this groundswell of this interest in locally supported um, enterprises, be they businesses or co-ops or, or, or whatever it may be. Um, and along comes me and says, okay, in all this world of positive energy, we need to understand the risk that comes with that. Um, and right in the middle, as I was coming to grips with not only the opportunities here that this represents for, for Vermonters, um, Congress comes along and punches me in the face with the Jobs Act, which to be clear, presents some opportunities, okay? But it is the most significant rollback of investor protections we have ever experienced. And if we lose sight of that, we're gonna lose one of the most important aspects of what you folks are working so strongly for. You know, we mentioned just, you know, a just society, just enterprises. A lot of that comes from trust. Mm -hmm. 
Now I want you to, I want you to take a minute and, and think about what you do and what you represent to the folks that you service through your communities. Do you know them? Do you bump into them in the market? Do you bump into them on your way to work or on your way home? Do you bump into them at your children's or your grandchildren's games? That's a different model than Wall Street. Wall Street ticks me off, I go away, they don't care, they, rarely know, they barely know I existed. You folks tick off one of your customers, they're your neighbor. Their kids or their grandkids are on the same team as yours. It is a different model. And if we do not understand the inherent risk of what we're talking about here in terms of our community, then we are short-sighting everybody involved in that marketplace. So that's the uplifting and, 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 and exciting portion of my conversation. Um, so to, to get on point, um, the JOBS Act. Is, is everybody at least relatively familiar with the JOBS Act on a high level? No. 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 Okay. So let's start with the most significant rollback of investor protections this country has ever seen. Um, let's flash back to 1929. Okay. Everybody understands Black Tuesday and everybody is, is, is familiar with, with the stock market crash and the depression that followed. What really led to that was um, highly speculative investments, lacking disclosure, lacking any type of regulation. Um, and I forget who it was, but one of the, the iconic wealthy families um, of, of America, um, the, the, the patriarch pulled himself out of the stock market. And when asked why, he said, when my barber and my bellhop are talking about investing in stocks, I know there's something wrong, okay? In our day and age, most of us in one manner or another are invested via Wall Street. So it, the times have changed, but some of the realities have not. So we go, we, we go through this, um, this major depression, we, we have the stock market crash. The federal government catches up to the states in the 1930s, 33, and, and you get the Federal Securities Acts. Um, and really, if you were to simplify securities law, it all comes down to disclosure. Okay, I've got to tell you what I'm doing. Um, now, the states beat the federal government there. You know, first state uh, securities law was the Kansas Blue Sky Laws, 1919. Um, but the federal government got there, and it was really all about disclosure and how we went about offering securities to people. We progress, we progress, we progress, and I think I don't think there's anybody who does what I would do who would argue that some of those laws are highly outdated. Okay, highly, highly outdated. The world has changed. Believe it or not, in 1919, they weren't really sure what this internet thing was going to turn into. <laughs> um, so we now get to you know to, to modern times, and we start to look at what can we do to modernize, and Congress. Collectively now, let, I mean, you know, Mark and I had this conversation. Listen, Congress collectively, okay, came together and came up with this Jobs Act. Both parties voted almost unanimously to pass this. If that's not the hugest red flag <laughs> since the cloud over here in Chima, I don't know what is. Right. So they passed this law, and uh, the president signs it almost immediately, and it's called the Jobs Act. It sounds good in, a, in, 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 a, in an election year, right? I will tell you this, I don't know if it'll create jobs unless you're a lawyer. I know it's gonna create jobs for the lawyers. Um, I am not one, I don't necessarily promote them, but they are important in our society, especially in this area. Um, so the Jobs Act, really what I wanna to touch on is really two aspects of the Jobs Act. Um, the first is Regulation D-506 offerings. Is anybody familiar with these? Okay, high level. High level. These are what you think of when you hear private placements. Okay. These are deemed to be predominantly um, made to accredited investors, high net worth, high income, typically seen as sophisticated investors. Um, the states are preempted from any front end regulation. Um, we do retain anti fraud authority. Um, that happened in 1996. 
right now, most of the capital raised in this country that is not done publicly is done through a private placement. It's also one of the number one areas uh, for investment fraud. In the last year to 18 months, approximately 18 broker dealers have been put out of business for selling this garbage. Okay, and I use garbage use. I mean, there are some good ones. Okay, I just, but my experience is is usually pretty bad. Um, so what Congress did is let's make this better because it's so great now. Let's make it better. So they took away a prohibition against public advertising. So very shortly, in, in the next two to three months, you are going to begin to see advertisements for 506 offerings on your TV every night. Now, it wasn't so long ago that you didn't see advertisements on for a prescription pill. Remember those days? Yeah. Who knew what restless leg syndrome was before that <laughs> happened? <laughs> So mm -hmm. what you're going to see is you are going to see, you are going to be bombarded with these advertisements for 506 offerings. Mm -hmm. Now the legitimate users of these offerings, when you and I, well, I'll use me, we all can accept I work in state government, I am clearly not a high net worth person, right? So if I were to call and say I want to invest in your offering, they're going to say no, you don't qualify. That is a proper company utilizing the law properly. My concern is the fraudsters are going to say, yeah, John, write me your check. So mm -hmm. expect to see these offerings. Um, it is a sophisticated offering. If you look to use that way, it does provide a lot of great things. It is geared towards accredited investors for the most part. Um, it does require registration um, with the SEC, and that's really form and check, and then potentially notice filing with your states. Unlimited offering amount, um, and it is a pretty normal aspect of corporate capital formation. So you will see um, them fairly regularly as, you, as your company moves up or your organization moves up. The other aspect of the, of the, the jobs bill is probably one you're going to be more familiar with. It's the crowdfunding aspect. Has everybody at least heard the buzzword for crowdfunding? No? Yes? Anybody? No. No. Okay. So um, you've heard of Kiva, Kickstarter, some of these, okay. So, or community supported agriculture. This is really the ground roots of what became crowdfunding. And crowdfunding is, um, I'll never remember the name of her company. Janice Shade is a woman who runs a business in Winooski, Vermont, and it makes um, all natural organic um, soaps and, and, and um, uh, hygiene products. And um, she had this idea that instead of going to angel investors or venture capitalists and asking for a million dollars, why don't I go to a million moms and ask for one buck? And that is really crowdfunding defined, okay? So instead of going to a, to a small number of people and get a lot of people, why don't I go to everybody and get a really small amount of money? So crowdfunding is going to allow small organizations via the internet to go out and say, invest in my company. And you can do so um, from anywhere from $2,000 to $100,000 per investor, um, depending on their income and net worth. Okay, so obviously as they go up, they can put more. No limitation on investors, up to a million dollars in any 12 month period. Okay, that's the very, very high level aspect of, of this provision. There is a lot to be done. A, it is, while in the law, it is not legal yet. We're still waiting on the Securities Exchange Commission to write the rules. Um, What's not legal yet? It is not legal to engage in the activity at this point. Like a Kickstarter campaign is not legal right no, now? No, Kickstarter is, but Kickstarter is a, is a contribution. I was using that as a, the, the funding platforms. I'm glad you brought me back to that. Kickstarter is a contribution. Here, we're talking investments, equity or debt investments in a company. So that's, that's the difference. Um, and so we're waiting on the SEC to actually formalize the rules. I will say this, there are probably um, two or three companies ready to launch the funding port portals, which are gonna be internet portals in Vermont alone. So when these rules go live, you are gonna see a tidal wave of this stuff. Um, I mean, I think it was Kickstarter who had the um, security breach four or five months ago, and there was 70,000 unapproved 
um, campaigns released, you know, via this breach. I mean, people engaging in this are, are it, it's going to be a tidal wave. Um, I also think it is going to be a massive cesspool of fraud. Yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> um, approximately 207 days from April 5th, which, uh, which now, it, it, so I, I do want to be fair to my federal colleagues. Um, so November 5th or whatever it is, um, right? And, and the reg, regulation D piece, the the advertising piece. Remember, all they're changing in, in the 506 piece is they're lifting a prohibition against advertising out of the rule. They were, supposed to, they were supposed to issue that rule on July 4th. They haven't issued it yet. Okay. So I am not going to say I would expect it to be done. I, I mean, is everybody familiar with Dodd-Frank? Yes. Dodd-Frank, we just celebrated the two-year anniversary. Some of the rules still aren't done. Okay, so that's just the reality. Sir, did you have a question? I just... How does, is, is, is there anything in the job that, or one of the things about starting a private equity firm that I found out when I started mine was that I can't public advertise, as you were saying. Another thing is that I, unless I have a pre-existing relationship with someone, is there anything that changes that? Or no. Anything that changes Because that, that's interstate 35. Yeah, you, you, yeah you're, I mean, you're still dealing, you know, the private fund, you're still dealing with the, the, the did you do a 506 offering? Is that how you started your fund? Or? No, we did it within the family, so but okay. we're, looking, we're looking to do some appeal. The, the one thing to keep in mind with the um, the 506 is um, if you do the public advertising, you lose the ability to use 35 non-accredited investors. Okay. Okay. So, uh, which, yeah. and, For, but he brings up a great point. Very important because I think a lot of us are, are, have a lot of non Exactly. So, I mean, there's a lot of people who are going to look and say, five minutes. Good luck there. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to be respectful according to the rules. So um, there are a lot of people who are going to say um, crowdfunding creates problems. If you start to look like Glenn and I were talking about, you know, one of his companies used venture capital and angel capital. Okay, I, I, how many are there? Any sole proprietors in here right now? Okay, so don't. Don't use the four-letter words that are going to pop in your mind, but I want you to think about this. You are in total control of your company, right? <laughs> Hypothetically, right? Play with me here a little bit. Um, you do a crowdfunding uh, offering, and you now have 500 investors. And once again, these aren't people you've never met. I mean, it is quite possible that many of these are going to be your friends, families, existing customers. You now have a whole new headache to deal with because they're going to want information. They're going to disagree with you. Uh, they're going to feel they have a stake in your company. Now you go to say, you know what? We want to grow some more. And you go to a venture capitalist and you say, oh, yeah, by the way, I've done a crowdfunding and I've already got 500 existing shareholders. So now you've got to deal with the dilution of their ownership if you do utilize a, a venture capitalist. And you got the venture capitalist saying, why should I deal with an organization that is going to be challenged with that many shareholders? Um, I'm trying to be cognizant of my time because we're getting watched closely. So here's the one thing I'm going to leave you with. This is a really developing area, okay? It is going to be enormously dynamic in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, as soon as it comes out, I guarantee you, for every dollar I'm worth, once again, state employee, that's not much, so don't take this to the bank. There is going to be a massive amount of fraud. So either as a company offering or, or thinking about a crowdfunding offering, as a potential investor, it is very, very critical that you do your homework and that you understand what's going on and you get the information you can be. These are not, I mean, there's going to be a lot of people like you folks who are engaged in really good activity. And there's going to be a lot of scumbags. I am biased in my positions because a regular part of my job is dealing with the scumbags. Okay? And trying to clean up the messes. I can tell you about the architect in southern Vermont who lost his life savings at 74 in a $28 million Ponzi scheme 
run by a Vermont movie maker who went door to door. I can tell you about the, the guy living in Massachusetts right now who's under charges from my office, the Secretary of the Commonwealth's office, and the federal government who happened to be from Ludlow, Vermont for taking millions of dollars recently in a fake Facebook offering. I can tell you about the guy who started in Vermont and lived, moved to Connecticut who took $21 million from 16,000 investors worldwide via the internet that is now doing 10 years of time in federal jail. So when I speak and I caution fraud, I'm not making this up, folks. Back to the original point, because I know I'm done. <laughs> it is vital that you folks, when you go out into this world, that you are cognizant of what's going on and what your competitors are doing as well as you. Because if they are engaged in fraud, what's going to be attached to that name? Crowdfunding. If you're doing crowdfunding or you're doing 506s, people are going to look at you and say, how do I know it's not you as well? Help out people like me. <clears throat> that $28 million Ponzi scheme in Vermont, I'll get right to you, sir. Uh, at 20, went on for 10 years. 10 years. Enormously successful business people, high-end lawyers, presidents of college knew about this and didn't think anything was wrong. Now, I don't know about you, I'm a little bit more um, untrusting, but if someone comes to me and hand writes on a piece of paper, I'm going to pay you 30% per year, I get suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't. Wow. $28 million. Sir, you had a question. As a fraud control officer, I'd like you to justify the use of an exponential function as a basis of a calculation of return. If, there, if that isn't um, fraud, I don't know what it is. And I guess you're going to have to explain the exponential okay. calculation. Future value equals present value times 1 plus the interest rate raised to the end power. If the end power is a year um, progress, that's, that's how you, that's how HP uh, built their uh, financial calculator. Okay. This is how you calculate a loan cost. This is the basis of pension fund calculation. It's, if I go to a bank and, and borrow money at 3%, they, they use that form, and, and if I don't pay it, um, my interest payment to them gets compounded. Yeah, like an exponential function goes through the roof. By definition, that's what exponential means. I just said earlier, when anybody has infinite value in a finite world, everybody else has nothing. And we use this as the basis of our calculation of value, of evaluation of every investment that we have, and every intelligent person in, in Massachusetts has never questioned that. So thank you, Alan. That's more, I think that's more of a statement. That's a good segue into... No, it's a question. Oh, you want to is there a question? No. <laughs> so, I, 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 I apologize. I, 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 I may not have followed the... That's okay. I want an answer. Can I ask a really quick question? Were any of these involved in independent audit? Was there fraud at the audit level? Because that's one of the things no. people have asked me about. How do I know? Because no, more often than not, these are completely off the records. There has been no audit. Right. So it's going to officially, even officially move to Q&A. Yeah. I don't know where you want to, yeah. want to position yourself, John. Um, Glenn, if you want to come down and participate. So, John, would you recommend to all investors to have, to, when they invest, not only due diligence, but perhaps independent audit if they have a track record? That is probably one of the best questions I've ever heard with, with, with this topic. And, 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 Alan, I do want to come back to you. Okay. Um, the Jobs Act, in terms of making a crowdfunding offer, set really low standards, okay? Really low standards. That does not mean that the porthole or the issuers engaging in the offer can't have higher standards, can't require better disclosures, can't require better audits. Um, I suspect at some point along the line there will be some kind of a best practices, you know, that will that will develop, 
Um, um, and while I, I'm not in, in the job of discouraging anybody from investing or, you, you know, I mean, look, my job is to enforce the law, right? Okay, and the law is going to say you can do this, okay? Um, I would encourage you as both an issuer and a, um, um, and a potential investor to aim higher. Um, because if you have better, um, if you have better practices and you disclose more, your investors are going to have a better place to develop that trust with you, and you're probably going to be more successful. I found that's pretty good. Honestly, it's the best possible. And, and I'm going to try really hard. Okay. Um, my, my, I guess my best way to, to attempt to answer that is our securities law are is federally and in, in, in state level are based on disclosure. So um, I don't say because IBM um, issues stocks into the market and that we expect you know X growth every year um, that ultimately um, whether they hit that or not is fraud. I mean I think everybody who invests in the stock market understands that there is risk. Um, and the uh, role of a regulator is to not eliminate risk, it is to make sure the investors are aware of the risks. Fraud is, um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, what's, a, what's a great example? Um, uh, Blake Prater. Blake Prater is um, a, a guy who, who was a convicted uh, felon in Oklahoma. He ran a fraud in part out of St. Albans, Vermont, uh, and down in Connecticut. Um, and what he said is, I'm going to take your money, I'm going to pull it, I'm going to buy companies that are distressed, I'm going to re, um, reconstitute them, rehabilitate them, and take those profits and pay you back. Yeah, they ain't capital does produce profits. They, they don't okay, have money so, off everybody. So, so here's the difference. Here's the difference. Okay, Bain Capital actually invested in companies. Blake Prater did not. That is fraud. Okay, he's now in jail. Um, no one from Bain Capital has been indicted or convicted of anything. Um, um, sir, I understand your role in trying to prevent fraud. Mm -hmm. and I understand the government's effort in this case, but honestly, when you're in a legitimate publicly traded uh, business, and they present what they call their books and so on and so forth. How many examples do we have where these companies follow all the rules, you have this false sense of security that you're investing into this highly reputable company like GM, Dodge, um, uh, uh, energy uh, company, and uh, run. 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 How is that any different than a person who wants to keep their money locally, invest in, not go through all these security acts because a lot of us are just not savvy in that area. We don't run in those circles. And so why should we be burdened? The point here is that everybody who invests, whether it's $5 or $5 million, should do a good investigation as to whether this is a reputable company on their own standard to invest. I mean, to have regulations and have all this red tape and things that if you're going to try to do this, you need to become a security expert, I think it's unreasonable. And, I, and I'm not trying to say that your job is useless. What I'm trying to say is that <laughs> the focus of your job shouldn't be in trying to hold back legitimate people, is that there's always going to be fraud. There's always going to be people who are going to go around the, the correct way of doing things and try to, you know, instead of doing the right thing, do the wrong thing and make money on it. The focus should be going after those people and not trying to hold back the few legitimate people that could be doing really good things if they're not held back by the same rules that hold back the criminals. We're not all criminals. A lot of us want to do the right thing, and we shouldn't be held to those same rules and held back because of that. And so I'm saying that the focus here is not on the legitimate people, the focus should be on the illegitimate people. You're going to get them, whether they sit behind a big office in GM or Enron, or you're going to get them by someone going on the internet and saying, hey, I got this latest thing. That investor, small or big, should do the due diligence and check them out. 
Ninety-five percent. 95% of what you just said is 100% accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me, because you are spot on, okay? So, let's talk about that. Enron, everything that went on in Enron was fully disclosed to the SEC and, and available to the public. Everything. No one caught it. Whose fault is that? Well, it's the SEC's, okay? It's their auditors, okay? Technically speaking, it's the states, though, in large part, those companies that are publicly traded on, on the large exchanges are, are outside of our domain. And it's the fault of every investor, every wirehouse, every broker term. I don't, you're absolutely right. Securities law, as it is currently defined, okay, has a dozen categories for how you can go public or how you can make an offering that's less than public, okay? A lot of those lower standards so that it is easier for small companies, okay? Now, we do still insist on some level of information being made public because it is disclosure and it is the ability of that information being public and being available that allows those investors to make the smart decisions. I agree with you, it should be easier for the smaller person, for the smaller company, 100%. The states were working on that when Congress shoved the Jobs Act through. Okay, we were trying to make it easier. Now here's the reality. Lynn and her folks called me, I don't know, December, and said, we'd like to talk to you. We'd like to come in and talk about what we're doing and see if you can help us. I think it was a week between Christmas and New Year's, because I was on vacation, we met with them, okay, to try to help them, okay? And you wanna know the great thing we talked about? No action relief, an order of exemption. These are things where I write a piece of paper out, my commissioner signs it, and it's done, and you're in business. These are options available to us, okay? We understand that you folks doing legitimate work isn't our problem. That doesn't mean we can ignore you. We know where the problem is. These guys, these examples I gave earlier, they were completely off the radar, okay? And that's why their, their, their conduct not only violated the laws I enforce, which are administrative, but they violated criminal law, and that's why they're now in jail. So, I understand your point. What I would say is, give your state securities regulator a call. In this case, it's the common, uh, Secretary of the Commonwealth Galvin's office, okay? He has a specific securities division. It's run by Brian Lantang. Give them a call and ask them if that you can come in and talk about what you're doing, if that's Massachusetts. Okay, if you're in Vermont, take my business card, call me. I think I've proven over the years that I am readily accessible. Um, Nobody in state government is going to say no to somebody trying to create more small businesses. It's not in our gene codes. In Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> I would invite you to talk to Mark Miner in the uh, New York Attorney General's office. Um, so I can see problems with investing through those, the, the, the market, mm -hmm. okay? And I can also see lots of problems with uh, millions of people, you know, anybody can hustle on the internet, send me a book, yep. yeah, okay, you get a couple. Okay, so I'm in the middle, and I'm looking for, how can we be sane about using our resources, and I'm not a high net worth individual, but I took my money out of the market, I don't trust it there, you know, I'd love to have it circulating in my community, right? Okay, I'd love to be earning a small return on it. So I get the brilliant idea, okay. I'm going to talk to 10 of my friends. I'm going to see who's got between five and $10,000 for investment in a specific product. We're going to form a little club, and we're going to have anywhere from fifty dollars to $100,000 in our club, and then we're going to look for good projects. What's the name of that? What am I, what am I talking about doing? And from your perspective, what are, the, what are the, oh, great, oh, that's great, and where does your big P pessimism come in? I knew I was in trouble when I got the sense of how creative you folks were. So, um, so I got a book that. The, the name of what that is can be almost anything. 
You could be running an investment advisor, you could be running a private fund, you could be running a, a, a closely held fund. Um, a lot of it would depend on, on the legal structure, thank you, somebody said, the legal structure of how you set it up, and then what you do with the money. Um, well, let, let's say, it's a let's general just say, term. Let's just, fund is a very let's just say, for, for my own, just for where my interest lies, let's say I'm not going to invest in <coughs> in uh, in the market. You know, because my 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 picture of an investment club is you go looking for good investment. Oh, let's go. And then you buy them on exchange. Right. right. They're let's publicly traded. Right. That's let's the say, that's the difference. Let's say you know, let's say you know, yeah. I know Joe Blow. I know the company that he runs. Mm -hmm. They're trying to do this. Locally, huh? I wonder if they could use a hundred grand. Let's go talk to him. You mm -hmm. know, that's so, not that's not going and 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 trying and looking more closely at the New York Stock Exchange. Right. So, interestingly enough, depending on how that's set up, that may not be a public offering. It may not even be an offering that comes into play with securities laws. Period. Which makes it super scary for you. Is that what makes? No, that's not, is that what's something not really, that's flying so, under the radar? Not really, because I mean. You know, You're talking about people that are going out to the public in general and, and bring that in. That's supposed to be very limited. I, 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 will, be honest. Very I will be honest. You know, it's, I, I can tell you absolute horror stories. So if I am on one side of the pendulum about my concerns, I hope you'll understand why. Because these people come into my office and they sit there and they tell me about their life savings that are gone. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can tell you about the woman who's trying to go to Castle and State College who just lost her scholarship fund because a close family friend said, give it to me for, for uh, 21 days and I'll give you 10%. But, but really, so, realistically, we're talking about the validity jobs that are $2,000 per person. We're not talking about life savings, right? Well, you're talking up to $100,000 depending on, on, on net worth, and you're talking no system in place to control how much of each each investor invests in various places. But, but, but you just can't, you can't say that every person's life savings is at stake when they're putting no more at a low income level than $2,000. What if their life savings is $2,000? I mean, look, I am throwing out there my concerns, okay? And I understand your skepticism at them because I suspect I am in a room of highly ethical people. And it is easy to say it's one person's $2,000 until in Vermont a $28 million scam was built on the backs of 450 people. So I understand your skepticism. I'm not saying you should buy into my story. What I'm saying is understand the importance of making a system that has checks and balances in, in a system that is built on trust and that the people who are operating in on it police what is done as much as they can and are willing to put extra effort into creating a system that is trustworthy. I want to intervene here for just one, one second um, to you know, co-facilitator uh, privilege here, but um, you said that the until I went to meet with John, um, with Tom and Michael from the Southern Vermont Council, uh, I didn't really understand the role of the securities division. But when John came in off of his vacation to meet with us for, I think, three hours, I learned a whole lot about the, really the incredible work that they've been doing. I, I saw securities laws as something that was a barrier to me getting my job done. I then learned that you know, the, the way it gets done, the transparency, the reporting that's required, you know, the, the limitations, the, the protection for consumers is actually as we're, we're a consumer-owned cooperative, co-op power is, we're consumer advocates. They're doing work that we want to see happen. So this is to me about a partnership. It's like how do, and that's why I'm so excited John came today, it's like how do we build a partnership where we get to the place where we can advocate and promote the things that are highly ethical, that really do work. But you know, even highly ethical people forget to make very good business plans. Yeah. And, ask for, and ask for A more money than they can realistically pay yeah. back. So we need to get very good um, review, you know, the second party, third party reviews of what we're doing and does it all make sense and can we protect the 
consumers who are putting whatever money in. We're going to take uh, two more questions and then we're going to break into uh, 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 some small groups to continue to, to discuss this. So if you don't get caught in the, in the two questions, it's not the end of the day. So um, we're going to go to somebody that hasn't spoken yet. Oh, I'm sorry, we're over here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a certified financial planner, I would just like to underscore what Lynn said and what Pete said. And my own question is, um, I think the level of investment knowledge of most people is zero to close to zero. And I think the UPS uh, person very often is the investment advisor. And so um, my question is, and I also think that um, there hasn't been enough regulation. It's been bought off. If you get a job at the SEC, there's one place you go. It's your reward. It's called Wall Street. So there's a reason they didn't discover math very wrong. So that said, I thank you for your service. Well, Susan, um, thank you for that. My, my question yeah. is how, and this is probably outside of your curfew, given what I've experienced about not only investment, but about structure of businesses, because a sole proprietor can't take investor. How do you build up the knowledge base so somebody in this room can actually think they know enough and perhaps even know enough? to invest in anything. So, you know, you, you talked about your, your experience in financial literacy. One of the things that we try to do, and one of the reasons that, that, that I'm here, is the way we try to promote investment in, in, in any business, small business or otherwise, is by educating the consumer, okay, so that they know where to ask, where to find out if somebody is licensed, somebody is registered, if, if they can find, uh, you know, some level of comfort that the, the business is um, legitimate because we want people to invest. I'm the child of a small business. I had a middle, uh, upper middle class upbringing and a great education because of a small business. Okay. The reason I drove three hours today to get here on a Saturday uh, is because I believe in what you folks are talking about. So the challenges I raise are just to be concerned because Susan hits the number one point that we can ever look at. The average American is financially illiterate. Okay? And everything you look at can do it. I'm very proud to be involved. Uh, we, I know we've got some Vermonters here. Um, Champlain College is going to be pilot testing a program in which we're going to be putting financial literacy trained teachers in schools for a three year period. Mm. Okay? Yes. Um, and, and thank you. Um, and oh, by the way, the money to fund that came from fines that we assess. <laughs> <for people. laughs> so that's coming out of, um, and just so you know that not everything in Wall Street is bad, that's coming out of Champlain College. They have a Center for Financial Literacy that's run by an individual who came from Wall Street and was able to retire. And he said, you know what? I think this is what I want to do with my time. So he's running this center and he's pushing financial literacy all over the state of Vermont. Yes, sir. Um, one of the questions. I happen to be standing with the auditory, one of the uh, major, one of the biggest international corporations. You wouldn't believe the pressure the auditors are on under when they are on the job. A uh, little open question. And uh, who is looking over the shoulder of so called smaller independent auditors, which we pay so much attention to trust? Second, who in this room really understands the money? How money is this created in this country and all over the world? How the debt is created? Mm -hmm. Who understands? Please raise your hand. I think I do. <laughs> I hope. So we're going to uh, have, so, have this one question, this and, very, and then, we'll, uh, then we're going to break into small groups and we'll discuss things further. So I think I, a couple of comments, and then, and then you know, you know, the, the one or two questions that was there. I think the most important question in terms of um, our system, okay? Because you know, you know, we're all part of this big system, right? And nobody pretends that it's perfect. I certainly believe me. I will sit here and own. You know, the fact that this fraud took place in Vermont under my nose 
let's be clear, folks, that's my fault. Okay? It was my job to detect this earlier, and I failed. Do you have the adequate resources to do your job for 100% of your ability? That, that's another issue. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of where I'm going. This system is huge, and it is complex, and it is moving, and it is dynamic, and it is exciting, and it is awesome. Yeah. And we can't stay ahead of it. Right. The reality is, no one looks over the head of the, the small auditors. Who's familiar with the Bernie Madoff case? Right. Yeah. What was this guy worth? How much money was this guy, quote unquote, managing? And he uses some little auditor with a two person shop up in upstate New York. Yeah. Why was that? Why do you think? <laughs> Okay, Enron uses some of the best law firms and some of the best um, auditing firms out there. Susan talked about this back and forth, SEC to Wall Street, okay? Well, that's not the only place it happens, okay? It happens in these firms, okay? And that's why, as us as investors, as investors now, it is vital that we pay attention to what's going on with where we choose to put our money and that we exercise control over our stewardship of our money. If I can leave you with anything, I would say this. As you look to do capital formation of any kind, crowdfunding, 506s, public offerings, anything, respect your investors' need to be good stewards of their money and help them to do so. And I'm going to be around.